let's, um, let's take a look. We'll read through our text once, and then we'll get to praying, and we're going to jump into the Word. Uh, so go ahead and, again, Mark chapter 2, we pick it up in our first verse. I'll let you get there. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Jesus is in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let, hit, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Then Jesus saw their faith, and he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there, reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man blaspheme, speak blasphemies like this, who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you then, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all. So, all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Pray with me, would you please? So here we are, Lord, in a cafe, opening up your word and asking for you to speak to us, to transform us more than inform us, to do more in our hearts, God, than just tickle them. God, we want to know you and your call on our lives better. We want tonight to be meaningful. And I pray that every one of us would be so glad we came. And Lord, you know right where we're at. You know what needs to be spoken into. You know, God, what this is like for us now. So may your word burst open and come alive for us. And may tonight be the night, Lord, where we get it. We genuinely get it. The penny drops. May we have so much fun in your word tonight. And may it all make sense, I pray. So Lord, now redeem every second as we commit this time to you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Hey, like always, please don't just believe me. Don't just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible always be your final say. Jesus cured a whole city, Capernaum. The city's name means village of comfort. And then he went on tour, teaching and healing and casting out demons out of synagogues. Jesus cleansed a leper and then told him not to tell everyone, but rather show himself to a priest as a witness to them, to the priests as a witness to him. And he tells everyone anyways. So Jesus now can't get away. The crowds are swarming him, and he runs even to deserted places, the places that he would have retreated to before with the Father before sunrise to pray. And uh, now they still come to him now from every direction, while the deserted places aren't very deserted anymore. So again, he returns to the city he transformed, Capernaum, which Matthew 9.1 calls it his own city, a city called Village of Comfort. It's no matter why Jesus actually says woe to them in Matthew eleven twenty three and Luke ten fifteen because in both cases it's sort of the idea that you had so much happen here and yet you still didn't respond. You watched so many miracles, but you really didn't claim what you really should have claimed here in the beginning. This story is so profound that three of the four gospels record this particular story here and in Matthew nine and in Luke chapter five. So Jesus is now trying to go. He's and please understand as we get right into this. Jesus has wanted a one-on-one -on -one with every human being. He doesn't call his sheep by crowd or by color or by race or by denomination. He calls them by name. And when this man, you know, people ask, why is it that Jesus would tell him? Well, don't go running, tell everyone. Well, Mark tells us why. Because the, man, the moment this man starts running around telling everyone about how Jesus cleansed him of his leprosy, Jesus can no longer call sheep by name in front of them because they come in such crowds he couldn't do that i think it's odd to me that christianity or a church success can be gauged more by the multitudes that they might attract 
where Jesus was trying to get away from that. He was just trying to get to the place where he could actually call everyone by name. Now, he had stayed up the last time. He was in Capernaum. He had stayed up all night, if you will, or it seems to be relatively so, so that all of the people who were sick were brought to the door after he'd healed Peter's mother-in-law. And it says that he healed everyone. He laid his hand on every one of them. It doesn't say he waved his hands over all of them and they were just all healed. He made sure that every person queued up you know, so that tells us it must have happened in England because we're the only country I know that queues up like this. And he, and he was able to touch every one of these people. He was not just going to go, all right, let's get all the lepers over here and let's get all the crazies over here and let's get all the people with the palsy over here. All right, ready, palsies, here we go, you're healed. You know, he's making sure that every one of you could say that I was personally touched by Jesus. And that's really profound to him. And now we have this story that happens. Now, Jesus has already been healing a great deal, so it shouldn't surprise us. Really, the greatest miracle in this may not, obviously, at least as far as all of the, the uh, gospel writers on this, really isn't the fact that this paralyzed guy could, couldn't get up and now he can. Though that's way cool and obvious, Jesus, of course, uses the whole thing in a, par- in a parallel in regards to sin. That's fundamental. I think that one of the greatest parts about the whole story, especially when we look at Mark, who focuses on Jesus' servanthood, is the four guys. And I really want to point that out to us as we kind of look at it from that angle, because Mark kind of plays that out here. Because what we have here is a miracle that took place because of a group of guys. Sneak on in, bro. So this is just going to make it real easy here. In this story, outside of Jesus, there's a, a crowd of people that we could call a unit. And then there's one paralyzed guy. And then there are four guys that we read here that are willing to get him to Jesus. Are you with me so far? So let's just play this out for a second. Tunde, you get to be paralyzed for a moment. Are you ready for this? This is just going to make it. Let's just have some fun. Okay, ready? Let's lay out three chairs. Would you guys do that? Let's lay out three chairs and let's get paralyzed Tunde on those three chairs. Well, we can get him on a table, but I don't want to get us in trouble with Winston. <laughs> yeah, look at this. Now, which one wants to rub his feet? I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's like, dude, I'm way happy with this. Okay, now, let's play this out for a second. Tunde is paralyzed. If Tunde is paralyzed, what do we know about the guy other than that? Okay, he's, he's on a cot. Tell me what, I mean, tell me what you would expect. Give, give me some understanding of this guy for the moment if he's been paralyzed for three days. And when we're talking about paralyzed, we're talking about from the neck down here. He can't move. Okay, so if he can't move, he can't move to do anything, can he? Yeah, why would that be? He can't bathe very well. Can't bathe very well. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, if he's not going to bathe without help. Or what he's going to do is he's going to drown, which isn't so great either. So, okay, but why else wouldn't he smell very good? What else do people do during the bodily functions? I mean, this guy can't get up to go to the toilet. So either, which one of you wants to pick up Tunde, carry him to the toilet, wait... And then at the end, he's like, okay, guys, I'm done. Who's going to wipe me? And then take him back out and put him in his place. And the reason I say that is this man here, I'm p- put the picture of this guy. This guy is laid out. Now, if a person is paralyzed, what does that basically mean? I mean, can you tell me medically what took place for that to happen? Uh, excellent. I mean, your head's the control center. Your head actually has these things that they send around that are called nerves. Those nerves are the things that tell you when something's bad or something's good. It's painful, it's hot, get away from that, those kind of things. Your nerves do those things. Your nerves are also the command center for your muscles that start talking about how to move something. There's a dog barking. Your brain says, get those nerves going and get those legs moving. Y'all with me so far? Somewhere down the line, that command center, something happened to break the connection between the command center and the rest of the body. The body that does stuff can no longer do stuff because even though the command center gives commands, something has broken the space between the command center and the part that does it. Your spine. Yeah. Your spinal cord, right, has actually, I mean, especially right at your neck, your T4 your A4 and so forth, these areas right here control a lot of that, are in essence the dispatch 
for all of your brains, no, you know, sort of all of the information goes to there and then gets to the rest of your body. So if you break it there, it's not going to be able to communicate. So in Tunde's case, we, he obviously probably smells bad. He's probably been sweating, but he's certainly been bodily functioning. And uh, even though his body ain't working real well, it's working that way. And so as a result of that, that's just staying on the cot. Y'all with me so far? And now with all of that, he can't bathe, so you've got that too. So you've got a guy that's kind of sitting in his own waist, a guy that's not being able to bathe. Well, tell me, what other things would we know? How about his muscles? What would we know about those? Spasm. Yeah, well, they'd start by spasming, but what happens ultimately? Deteriorate. They deteriorate. Excellent. They, they atrophy is the word. In other words, they keep getting smaller because there's no, no need to use them. Apparently, I've been using my stomach a lot because I'm actually really, I'm developing quite, I, six pack. Oh, man, core, man, I'm telling you, my core is like Jupiter. Okay, now just get me on this. So he's got, I mean, his arms are just kind of, they're just skeletal. His legs are skeletal, and he's there. Are you with me so far? This guy's not getting to Jesus. Now, in stories before this, what we've watched is the disciples get people to Jesus. They basically, their whole idea is if I could get him to Jesus, he could fix them. And they would get, you know, the paralytic, or they'd get the, you know, the, the possessed, they'd get the powerless, and they would, they would get people like this to them. But we don't read here that it's the disciples. We read, there's a term that's used, and the term in the other Gospels is friends. There are friends that are here. There are people who are being friends. So here's the deal. You with me so far? We're setting the scene. Now, we don't know how far they had to take them. We just know somewhere down the line where they're going to wind up. So it really doesn't matter how far it is. But follow me on this. It starts with this. Jesus enters Capernaum again, and it was heard that he was in the house. Verse 1. The house, most assumedly Simon Peter's house, because it's the only house been mentioned by name in Capernaum. So imagine you're at Simon Peter's house. What do we know about Simon Peter? Oh, no, no, that's John Mark, bro. That's it. Yeah, he's kind of an impetuous, he's quick to talk. He's basically, in my opinion, he's kind of a drummer. I, a Dan actually is not your stereotypical drummer. Your drummer is usually the guy that blurts something out that everyone's probably thinking, but nobody actually, we just have actually have a filter, you know. Well, get the idea. Simon Peter is the kind of guy that we find comfort in because he's so full of manness that we kind of go, praise the Lord, God calls people like this because I feel like this guy. And it tells us in verse 2 that so many are gathered together that there's no longer room to receive them. So get this. Simon Peter's house, the last time he had Jesus there, don't miss this. The last time he had Jesus there, he healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law, and then everyone came to the door. We don't read they came in. Now the next time happens, we have Jesus in the house, and everybody comes in. Now this is much different than the last time. So what happens when you have a room or a house chock full of people? Yeah, it's hot and what? Yeah, it gets hot. It get, yeah, you get squashed. It gets hot. It's stifling. You know, northern line, 9 a.m., any direction. Central line, 11, on one of those days when all the tourists are here. You know, it's like, and, and there's another thing. It starts to smell. Smells have this habit of, like, multiplying exponentially in a hot room. Probably aware of that. That's why Dan tries to avoid that around certain people we know. Uh, the idea is kind of simple. So imagine you will, and just don't miss that. You're in a, I mean, it seems like all the air gets sucked out of the room. Does that make sense? When everyone's kind of shoved in there, it just kind of feels like it's just nothing's happening anywhere. So when someone opens a window and it's like salvation for a moment. And the reason I say that is imagine a house chock full of people, chock a block. We are all just shoved together, kind of like, you know, pencils in a thing or whatever, you know, like sardines, and we're there, and it says there's no longer room, not even at the door. So you start packing people in, you know, think about what it's like if you've been on a train on one of those moments. And what happens in the beginning is people kind of take their spaces and it kind of peppers out, right? And then more people kind of shove in, and it's like usually that area where people come and go gets real tight, but then there's people kind of off onto the sides staring at the people in their seats. Then ultimately it gets so packed, everything's packed. And at that point, you almost pity the person who's sitting down because they have to get up and funnel their way through 50 people to get out the door. And at that point, it's just like one big hot box traveling around. And what he tells us is it's so packed that at this point now, 
you, I mean, it packs and it packs to the point where you got to the door and now it's like people are standing at the door. That house is just chock-a-block full of people. And that's where we're at at this moment. News has gotten out that he's there and immediately the house is packed. And it's not now, understand, Jesus has healed the city. So everyone's not there to be healed anymore. They're there to hear, not to be healed. But not everyone there is to hear. And the countertext in Luke 5, 17, hear me, is there were Pharisees and teachers of the law, hear me, sitting by, because they're not going to be standing, who had come out from every town in Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Wait a minute. The religious leaders, why would they need to be healed? Yeah, the scribes are going to, we're going to see here in a moment, they're part of it. a good question, Damon. Let me put it this way. We have here, we might say that we have certain kinds of political parties. And it's usually by their affiliations, if that makes sense. Like we have, Dan, help me out here. There's the Tories and the Labour, right? Now, that just kind of tells you what what their affiliation is. Does that make sense? How they're going to probably vote. Well, in the religious system, there are Pharisees and Sadducees in that same way. In the traditional sense, the Sadducee is going to be rather liberal with their context. And the Pharisee is going to be much more the legalist. So you have the liberal and the legalist is kind of the idea. Now, the scribes were actually, in essence, guys that read scripture and tried to decide what it meant and tacked things onto it. They actually call that binding. For instance, when it says you have to keep the Sabbath, and it says you can't carry a burden on a Sabbath, so then they have to ask, well, what's a burden? I have a, I have a feeling that a burden for someone like Cody wouldn't necessarily be the same as a burden for someone like his wife. Although I'd say that she's probably a pretty strong gal as far as gals her size go. So what do we pick? So in other words, so you have a group of scribes that have to figure out how not to break that rule. Does it kind of make sense? So the scribes, in essence, are kind of your commentators. So they got together, and they're like, okay, well, what do we decide? Well, we have to, in other words, what they're saying is to be safe, let's find the weakest person, and what wouldn't be too heavy for the weakest person? Then we'll call that a burden. And what they've decided is, is that you couldn't carry anything heavier than two dried figs. Now, you ever see what a dried fig is? It's just two large raisins, in essence. They took those two things and they said, anything heavier than this, you can't carry anymore on a Sabbath because it's breaking the law. That's what a scribe did is they decided those kind of things. So then you ask, well, what about a pencil? They'd have to weigh it out. Is the pencil heavier than two dried figs? That's the idea. That's why when a guy carries his mat, for instance, on a Sabbath, they're going to get really upset because you could bet the mat's heavier than two dried figs. Does that make sense? So the scribes are always the ones, because they wrote the laws, they're always going to be the ones to enforce them too. So the house is packed. What does Jesus do when the house is packed? He preaches the word. That's what he does. But I want to remind you, not everybody's there to hear the word. You've got these religious leaders. And these religious leaders, in the simplest sense, they obviously, it says the power of God was was available to heal them. So imagine Jesus looking, these people need to be healed from what? Well, they had contracted this issue in self-reliance and it was incubated in their pride. They were, well, hear me on this. There's a guy that's dropped in front of Jesus and he's paralyzed. Why is he paralyzed? Because they have broken between the command center and the rest of the body. Does that make sense? Well, and that's the problem with the religious leaders. The religious leaders were spiritually paralyzed. According to scripture, do you know what the head of the church is? According to Ephesians 5, it's Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. Do you know what we're called? The body of Christ. Now consider this. Your head's everything from your neck up. How many senses are on your neck, from your neck up? How many, first of all, how many senses do you have? Five. five. Good. Nice job. Unless you've been watching old Bruce Willis films. But there's only five. Now, what are they? What are those senses? Sight. Sight hearing. hearing smell. smell. Touch. touch Taste. Nice. How many of those are on your head? What, all of them. Which one are you missing? If I, so if I slap you in the face, you wouldn't feel it? Well, you'll feel anywhere, but yeah. Okay, so how about this? Underneath your neck, how many senses still exist? Just one. Your sense of feeling. And might I say, when a church disconnects itself from the headship of Christ... It's going to be moved by its feelings because it's all it's got. 
when these religious leaders, they were all about the law and they were all about their pride and they were all about their, their gig, but they had lost the headship of God now. They were paralyzed and they couldn't see it. And God lays this out right in front of us and says, man, God wanted to heal them of their spiritual pride, of their spiritual paralysis, but they weren't really interested in it. And the power of the Lord was prevalent to heal both the paralytic in front of them and these religious leaders. Now, when Jesus deals with the paralytic, do you remember what Jesus says? Because he doesn't just say, hey, son, your paralysis is healed. What does he tell him? Take a look in the verses. He calls him son, and then what does he tell him is done? Your sins are forgiven. He goes, that's the issue. In both cases, what severs a man from God? Sin. Isaiah tells us that your iniquity has separated you between you and God. There becomes the problem. Now, the only way to get that thing away from you is it has to be lifted away. And there's our problem. So let's just put it this way. Let's say Damien has a bad day and he decides to kill all of Tunde's family. It was a rough day. Well, you think it was a bad day for, for Damien. It was even a worse day for Tunde. Rough day. Now, in between Tunde and Damien is this act. Does that make sense? It's going to be really rough for the two of them to have a relationship. In between them now is a wall, and that wall is this event. Why would you do this? How could you do this? Why did you do this? Did you realize what happened to my family? This thing is between you. Well, here's the problem. What if Damien at this point just decides he's going to be a nice person? Do you think Tunde is going to care? If Damien's like, well, you don't understand. At this point, I joined, you know, like the scouts, and I'm being nice to people, and I'm selling flowers for other people, and I'm painting old people's houses. Hey, it may be nice, but it doesn't mean a lot to Tunde. Does that make sense? Because the issue is still between them. This is the problem with man and God, is that man sins against God because we're guilty of the death of Jesus. And in between us is our guilt, and somebody has to lift that guilt off. If that makes sense. They have to lift the wall away. And the, all other religions, all other religions outside of Jesus are about trying to make yourself look nice, but it doesn't deal with the wall. There's our problem. So like, hey, look, at you go and make your trip and your hajj and you pray and you give all this stuff. And if you could just be nice enough and you're a church member and all of this stuff, you're cool. But there's still the wall. It, doesn't make, it just makes you prettier on the other side of the wall, but the wall's still there. Now, does anyone know the Hebrew word for to lift off? That'd be weird if you did, maybe. The Hebrew word to lift off is NASA. I kid you not. That should be easy to remember from this point out, like lift off. N-A-S-A, NASA. Boom. Lift off. It literally means to lift it off completely. The Greek word for lifting off is the word afiemi. It literally means to lift out of. Do you know how that word is translated in scripture? Forgiveness. That's what the word means. See, when we're asking God to forgive us, we're not asking him to just kind of overlook something we did wrong. We're asking him to lift off the wall that's between us. God, God, I'm admitting to you this wall between us. I'm admitting to you that wall is bad. Will you lift that wall off, please? And it tells us that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive that sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's the cool part. He's faithful and dedicated to removing the wall. Oh, I love that. These religious leaders, they're there listening to Jesus, but they're not there listening for forgiveness. And it was there to, to give them. They were scrutinizing every word, even as today, looking for a crack, looking for a fault, looking for a fracture in Jesus' character. In doing so, they show that they're ignorant of the real healing they need, while the Lord has this power present to heal them, and they're not even interested. And pride, by the way, pride is a foolish jerk that says, there's no wall. Shut up. There's the problem. It says, then, verse 3, they came to him. In front of the religious leaders, Jesus has a lesson for both of them. They came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. In Luke 5.18, he tells us that they, he was brought on a bed and laid before Jesus. 
And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Now, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sin is forgiven you. In Luke 5.18, it says, men brought this man. Here, of course, we read that it was four of them. In Luke, it tells us that they couldn't figure out how to get there because of the crowd, so they went up onto a housetop. And they let him down his bed through the tiling that was above him in the midst before Jesus. You guys, I'd like to talk to you about what it really means to be a friend in Scripture. And I'd like to use a term that I pray you and I will remember for the rest of our lives now. And the term is cot carrier. There comes a point in time where you're going to need your cot carried. Where you're the guy that's laid out. And it could be because of an addiction. It could be because of a tragedy in your, in your family. It could be because some other circumstance has laid you out for the day and you were just in a place where you were laid out flat. God forbid, it, it could be just out of horrible disobedience and self-reliance. And you've gotten to this place where you've gotten so far, but now you just can't get any farther. You're trying to do it. And then you realize how far you are from the Lord and all this, and you're laid out. You just can't do it anymore. And you just blow, you blow the fuse and you're laid out cold. My question is, Who's going to carry your cot at that moment back to Jesus? Well, let me ask you. Are you the kind of person that's a cot carrier for someone else? It's going to be likely that the guys that will carry your cot are the guys you would carry theirs. But I want to remind you, carrying a guy's cot costs a lot here. It's not just picking up a guy and getting him. In this case, it's picking up a stinky guy. And it's doing more than just that. Follow me on this. Real friends don't just make people feel better. Their friends feel better about their sin. Friends take them to Jesus. Real friends don't pretend that there is a problem, that the problem isn't there. Real friends take friends to Jesus. Real friends don't dodge the issue to try to keep peace. Real friends take friends to Jesus. Friends don't avoid the truth to not offend someone. Real friends take friends to Jesus. Friends don't assume that one day they'll just roll over and find themselves at Jesus. Real friends take friends to Jesus. Friends don't just shut up about Jesus because they're afraid they'll lose a friend. Friends are going to be concerned that they may lose them forever if they don't take them to Jesus. Real friends take friends to Jesus. So who's a cot carrier? Somebody that's convinced if they could plop this guy in front of Jesus, he could take care of him, he'd be whole. And they're so personally involved that they'd pick up a filthy, stinky man and carry one drenched in their own stench through the inconveniences, through the distances, through all of the tangled brush of crowds, through all of the routes that were inconvenient, through plans B, C, and D, through all of their personal expense to get him to a healer because they know that if they can get him to Jesus, he could actually make him whole. And then I ask, who's the carried in this? Who's the guy that needs to be carried? He's helpless. He's hopeless. He's putrefying, he's pungent, he's paralyzed, he's powerless, but he's cared for, and because he's cared for, he's carried. He's cared for, and because he's cared for, he's carried. So follow me on this. Play this out for a second. Let's just make this, let's make it a a quarter of a mile. Uh, A quarter of a mile from here is the DLR station. If you can give me an idea, it's about a third of a mile, to be honest, from here. So let's go that third of a mile. So here's the way it works. Ready? Back to our situation here as we have here. Tunde, he's the paralyzed. He's the stinky friend. Right? So back in your situation. He's down there. You guys look. Now the four of you guys get together and you're like, you know what? Let's get Tunde to Jesus. Wouldn't that be an awesome day? Wouldn't it be cool if we could carry Tunde? Now here's the cool thing about Tunde. Whether Tunde wants to go there or not, he can't stop you. Let's just be honest. It isn't like he can do, he can roll over or anything. This guy's in a place where he's going to go where you take him. Because what we're going to find is, it isn't even that Tunde has faith in the story. So get this. The four of you saw our paralyzed friend and you wanted to be the friend. You wanted to be that cop. We're going to be the cop. We're going to get this guy to Jesus. Y'all with me so far? 
So what happens? They dropped whatever they could do for the day, and there was a coordinated effort. We actually don't read that these guys even knew each other before this. We don't read a lot about them. So we've got two stories. They bump into each other and go, hey, there's a paralyzed guy. Let's go. Or maybe they had a meeting. So let's play it out that way. So the four of you sit together for a moment, and you're praying. And as you're praying, the Lord puts Tunde on your heart. And you're like, you know what? Jesus is in town again. I just heard Jesus is in town, and he's healing everybody. And Tunde needs to be healed. If he had healed everyone in the town, I kind of get the idea it wasn't from Capernaum. That's even longer. But for this case. So you guys are like, what do you think, Cody? You up for it? Yeah, man, I think that's going to be cool. What do you think, Damien? Damien's like, you know what? I'm going to do anything for a little bit. Let's just go and carry Tunde. What do you think, Mike? Mike's like, yeah, I'm kind of up for seeing a miracle. Mike's like, what about you, Daniel? Daniel's like, uh, Okay. Daniel's like, yes, let's get a miracle out of this. Now, here's the thing. You guys can sit and watch Tune Day, just sit there or lay there. Or you can go and do a miracle. You could be part of someone's miracle. You can be part of someone's miracle. So they drop what they were doing for the day. Well, I don't know how long this is going to take. Where's Jesus? Okay, he's over at Simon Peter's house. He's at the house. Well, we kind of know where that is. So what happens? You guys take on the challenge to bring your friend to Jesus. So what's the first thing you guys decide to do? Well, probably carry him, which means you guys are going to have to bear the weight. So, two of you pick one side, two of you pick the other, because he's not going to get there any other way, is he? So, he's on a cot. The cot does have handles, because the cot has to be laid out if he's been a paralytic for any period of time. So, which, way, which side do you guys grab? Who goes where? You guys tell me. Call dibs. You take the head. Who else? You got his right leg. Okay, so that means Tammy and Cody got the legs. Mike and Daniel got the head. Does that make sense so far? So you guys are picking him up. So go ahead, Tune, lay yourself out. Guys, put yourself in position for a second. Let's just have a little fun. <laughs> yeah, wait till we get to the stoning of Stephen. Okay, yeah. Okay, so this is where you guys are at. Are you guys with me so far? So you begin to carry the weight. Now, here's the problem with the weight. The weight is, the weight's going to be fine for the first maybe 20 steps, but there's four of you. So which wants to be the first guy to say he's heavy? Your guys. You all know what I'm saying? But you might, and, and if he really is a friend, let me ask, which one of you says, woof, this man is ripe? Does anyone, do any of you want to say that? Do we, and by the way, we read nowhere in the story that Tunde goes, you guys, I'm so blessed by this. You guys, I'm so blown away. This is so cool. You guys are, we don't read any of that. We don't read that there's even a point where he's like, guys, thanks. We don't even read that he wanted to go. But we do read, you guys want him there. Does that make sense? Look at the four of you for a second. Look at the power that God's putting in the four of you. You're going to get him to Jesus. So you pick him up, and as you pick him up, you start carrying him. Y'all with me so far? Now, at this point, you're burying his weight. Because it's not going to get there anyway. So you pick up Stinky Tune Day. Now, you're able to, because he's unable to leave for the toilet. You know that's it. So once you pick him up, stuff starts dripping. Now, yeah. now, if that's the case, and he's going legs first, you know what that means for Daniel and Michael? They've got to be careful where they step. Because let's face it, at this point, they're going to be stepping in Tune Day's last lunch. So they're going to be a little careful about that. Now, here's another thing. If they're carrying him and there's actually stuff on the cot, you guys are going to want it to be level, aren't you? Because what happens if it's not level? Stuff comes rolling. So, do you, I mean, now think about that. Now, your guys, there's a part of me that would want to lift a little higher just to see what happens. Well, anyways, you know, you get the idea. Now, as you start coming out, you start seeing a few people. Now, what do you think happens the moment you see a few people as you start, you know, you start kind of heading from where you're at in front of people? Now, what do you think those people are going to think? Yeah. Now, I mean, imagine, though, but it's like you bring in stinky guy, right? So you can imagine. Now, that means that you're inconveniencing people, even if, let's face it, here. You ever have that where some people you need, like you're either going to walk on the street and get clobbered by a bus, or actually they have to move so you can walk through, and they look at you like you're the problem? So you're carrying a person. The reason I said you're going to get a few people and you're going to get a few looks. Does that stop you? 
You know, it's like, oh, come on. Now you're like, are you embarrassed to be seen with this? Now, I remind you, you're in a culture where if a guy's paralyzed, maybe it's because of a sin. And you guys are carrying a guy that's paralyzed. So they're going to kind of look. There might be a few whispers. Do you still carry him? Or do you kind of just drop him? Oh, you know what, actually? Jesus, maybe will walk this way later. Let's just leave him here. But you commit, right? Because you're caught carriers. So you guys got the legs. You guys got the head. You with me so far? And as that's the case, you're carrying them a little farther. As you carry them a little farther, people turn into crowds. And people turn into crowds, and as people turn into crowds, now you're actually trying to push and shove your way through things, and you start to realize that crowd is in the house that you want to be in. Is that enough for you? You're like, well, we got him this close. Let's face it, Jesus has to leave this house sooner or later. Do you leave him there? Let's face it, wouldn't you think, I'm just being honest here, if we could be raw, wouldn't you think you've done a good deed? Come on, man, I got him close enough. This is cool. But not enough for Jesus to see your faith. So what do you do? You're like, well, we can't get through this house. So which one of you comes up with the idea? Daniel? Daniel's like, I know. Let's get on top and drop him down. And you think, well, that might work. But think of the level of commitment. How do you get Tunde up from where you're at to the next story. Okay, now there's going to be two ways, right? And here's the thing. On one side, you can have, I mean, do you picture it, right? So you guys got the stretcher. Do you put it on your shoulders and then you try to level it? That doesn't sound really good for any of you. Right, okay, so we have another way. Well, where are you going to get rope? Well, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, you've got two options. One is you met beforehand and got rope, but we don't read anything like that, or you're actually wearing one. That's right. That's right. I mean, we have belts today, but in those days they had sashes. So we're going to get them up. So what happens? Okay. Now, I want to remind you, do you think those handles are clean and nice? No, but you've been holding them anyways. So you wrap them around those four sides, and you get a couple guys up at the top somewhere, and you get them to try to lift them up, so you kind of crane them up, kind of winch them up, while the other two of you maybe stand, but not directly underneath, and watch them get up there. And then you kind of get up. And then there's two different ways. There are stairs on the side of some houses, and then there is a ladder on some of them. Now, I would prefer the stairs, but just the same. In this case, maybe the easier way is to winch them up on it. But you get it, and he gets up to the top. You with me so far? Now, as he's up to the top, you still haven't gotten him to Jesus. Now, let's face it. At this point, you guys are probably pretty tired. Getting a guy up there can't be easy. But you can't leave him here. That is the worst place to leave him. Because in this case, in the noonday sun, Tunde is going to be, well, he's going to be fried Tunde at this point. So we got to get him in. Does that make sense so far? So you got him this far. Now you've gotten above the crowds. Now, inside the house, it's stifling, right? It's shoved full of people in. It is hot, and it's full of people. You all with me? And as it's full of people and it's shoved in, you guys got to get tuned in, and someone says, now we got to get him through this roof. But then you have to ask, well, who's going to pay for the roof? Well, Tunde's not. He's not. He's not got any cash. So you look and you think, Mike, Mike's probably Mike's going to pay. My guess is the four of you are. My guess is the four of you are like, you know what? This is how important it is to get tuned to Jesus. We'll pay whatever it takes. But you're ripping through Simon Peter's house. Now, crowds there. Now, who do we know was in that room? Yes, the scribes and religious leaders. The religious leaders are there. Obviously, other people are there. Jesus is there. We'll assume his disciples, but it does tell us the scribes are there. You're right. So they're there in this room. And all of a sudden... What is, okay, so now you're in the room for a moment. What do you think it looks like from the top? You start hearing noise. And by the way, you might be familiar, they take large logs, and then they take reeds, and they cover them in mud, and they take a layer, and they take another reeds and cover them in mud, another layer, and they take the wood, and they get it wet. Because what happens to wood when it gets wet? It expands. So that kind of tries to make an airtight seal. So what they have to do is they have to start pulling logs off and ripping through mud. So they're ripping through this stuff. And in the beginning, it just probably sounds like very, very large mice up there. And then what happens is sooner or later, you hear it and it gets louder and louder. And then dust starts falling. 
And then after dust starts falling, then the clods of dirt start falling, and the pieces of grass start falling, and there's nowhere for people to flee. Everyone's shoved together. The religious leaders are getting covered in dust. Now, I don't know if you picture this, but does anyone know what happens in Scripture when a guy covers himself in dust or puts dust on his head? He's mourning death. He's actually in a place of repentance. That's the two places where someone covers themselves in dust. And I think it's a kind of a cool image. Jesus is there and all these people are covered in dust. And these guys rip through. Now imagine, you rip through this hole and imagine Simon Peter can't be happy about this. He's like, what, what are you doing on my roof? But that hole's not big enough to get Tunde through. How big do you think you need to make the hole to get Tunde through the roof? You're basically digging a grave, if you think about it in that sense. So you're ripping through, and you're ripping through. Now, how long do you think something like that takes? I imagine all far up there at that point. But here's the dangerous thing. If you're ripping through there, you can't just rip through there indiscriminately. Why? Yeah, you don't want to fall through. So you have to do it in a way you can get him through, but you still stay up. So you're kind of finding the floorboards kind of thing, you know, making sure you've got weight bearing. So you got there and you're ripping through it. And so finally you start dropping them through. You guys with me on all that? Okay, go ahead and have a seat, you guys. Thanks. But thanks for being there. <laughs> now, if the room is packed, then it's stifling. And if the room is stifling, the best thing you could possibly do in that room is bring and drop a stinky guy in there. Wouldn't that just be awesome? Have you ever been on one of those really hot days here? Well, let's face it. Actually, here it hits 25 and it's just way hot. You know what I mean? Because it's the city and then you're on a bus on one of those kind of moments. It's like it was 42 degrees yesterday where we came from. I'll give you an idea. But here, it's 25, and then one, I'm like, you know, I'm going to try to be kind to say this, but like a man who clearly hasn't bathed for like, since he was like his bar mitzvah, and he's like 75 now, you know, and he's clearly homeless, and he comes onto the bus in the whole room. You just know when you walk out, you're going to walk out with some of that. Imagine in a room like that, and you are dropping. I mean, this guy's above you. What's he leaking? What's dripping off of him as he's dropping down? And at this point, chances are your sweat's dropping with it because you've been working hard to get through that roof. And you know what the coolest thing is? That when Jesus looks, he doesn't see the guy first. Who does he see even before the guy? Look at verse 5. Whose faith? Yeah. Imagine what Jesus hears that scratching. You can imagine Jesus is like, that's the sound of a friend. That's the sound of a committed friend. And then he looks and he sees as this man's coming down, he looks at their friends. And I, what kind of look do you think Jesus was giving you at that moment? Man, I can't imagine it be anything other than, man, way to go, boys. That's what I'm looking for. Could you imagine that smile just once, what that would be worth? Would it be worth the commitment it took for you to get him there? To carry the smell, the times you almost gagged, but you didn't want to do it in front of Tune Day because you didn't want to bother him, and then seeing the crowded house and getting up there and the price you're going to have to pay to fix that guy's roof? And Jesus looks and he goes, now let's deal with the other one. That's what I'm looking for. And then he looks at the man and he says, son, your sins are forgiven you. By the way, this is the first time in the gospels we read that term, that your sins are forgiven. And he says it to this guy. The scribes in this, were sitting there in verse six, and now we're going to close this up. They were reasoning in their hearts. What does that mean that they're reasoning in their hearts? It doesn't say. He could be 90, he could be, he could be 18. What's that? Yeah, he calls him son. What a tender word. And you know, think about the things that could be listed into that. Was this guy abandoned by his family when he was paralyzed? Did he, was he born paralyzed? We don't really know. I mean, there's so many stories you could write. We just don't know what the story is. 
But we do know somehow that Jesus knows calling him son is going to mean something. Because like the head, like the body connected to the head is where everything gets direction, the son to his father would be as well. Because your sins are forgiven. You remember that word forgiven, afiemi? Do you remember what it means? Yes, to lift off. Your sins are lifted off you. The scribes are sitting and reasoning within themselves or reasoning in their hearts. What does it mean to reason in your heart? Yeah, they're not saying it out loud. They're thinking it inside. And they're saying, why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can, sin, who can forgive sin but God alone? They said it within themselves. Immediately, Jesus perceived this in his spirit that they reason thus. And he said to them, why do you reason these things in your heart? In other words, he's nailing them on what they're thinking inside. It's for what it's worth. In Hebrews chapter four, verse 13, it says that there is no creature hidden from his sight and all things are naked and open to him whom, to whom we must give account. There's nothing you can hide from God. But if you think God's just looking to find hidden things to blast you, hear this, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. It says, judge nothing before it's time until the Lord comes who will bring, listen, will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, reveal the counsels of your heart, like these guys. But he says, then each one's praise will come from God. What about those moments when you actually reason something right in your heart and you really wanted to do it and somehow it just never happened? He still sees it. So Jesus says, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you or get up and walk. Take your bed and walk. But notice he says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Wait a minute, verse 10. So who may know? Yeah, so who's he talking to? Yes, and who was reasoning in their heart? Yes, don't miss that. The religious leaders, do you know what the one thing they missed? Forgiveness. They were all about judgment. They were all about keeping the law, but they didn't see the power in forgiveness. Please hear me on that for you too. Because I'm, chances are you have something you don't want to forgive. But there's a power in that, man. It sets you free. We've often said bitterness is like drinking poison to spite your enemies. And, and understand Jesus, and so you guys can know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sin. That's why I'm doing this. I'm not just healing this guy for this guy. I'm healing this guy for your sake so you can see that there is forgiveness in this room. Because remind you, the power was present to, to heal them. How did they need to be healed? They needed to be forgiven. Because he's going to give, you know why? Because he gives us the power to forgive now too. So he says, look it, take up your bed and go to your house. He goes, look it, anyone could say your sins are forgiven. How are you going to know? But so that you will really know this is the case, this is proof. Because what sin does to you and your guilt is what this man has physically, is what you're, what's happening to you spiritually. You are spiritually paralyzed. And this man, now I'm going to show you that I'm going to get, tell this guy to get up and he's going to get up the same way that you could be set free and you no longer have to be laid low by your own sin and guilt. You could be set free. That's the point here. So he says, look it, get up, take your bed, go to your house. Immediately he rose, took up this bed and immediately went in front of the presence of everyone. And as he did, Understand where, I mean, did this guy land on people's heads? If there was no room in the house, there wasn't a flat space on the floor to leave him. Did people flee the house when stinky guy came in? We really don't know. If there was a table, he might have landed there. But who's going to eat dinner on that table tonight? And you're like, still smells like Tunde. And the people were amazed. They said, we've never seen anything like this. Listen, you guys. Could you imagine having this commitment for anyone? Well, like, you know what? What if you're in that place where you're like, I don't even want to go. I don't want to be there. And God's like, no, no, you don't understand. You need somebody that loves you enough. And I would recommend four that love you enough to say, you know what? Come with us anyways. You need Jesus. Jesus. And like, you don't understand, there's this problem, and I need to work out this problem. And they're like, no, there's Jesus, and he's your answer. No, you don't understand, I've got this issue, and oh, there's all this stuff, and I'm, I feel like I stink in my sin, and I'm, and I'm just laid out because of all my stupid choices. And like, you need Jesus. Well, I, if I go to the church, it'll, the roof will cave in on me. Maybe you need the roof to cave in so you can be let in through it. The bottom line is you need to get to Jesus. You're like, well, I'm not too sure I want to go. Well, you're coming with me, buddy, coming with me. 
Because sooner or later, you're going to be the guy on the cot, and you need guys that will love you enough to do the same. Isn't that true? We all need cot carriers. But understand, a cot carrier is someone who loves you enough that, it's, that they stop weighing out if it's inconvenient, how much time it's going to take. They're going to stop weighing out, well, wait a minute, how heavy are you? Or what is it going to cost me? They're like, I'm going to get you to Jesus, and that's my one goal here. But if, if you need cot carriers, then you need to be one. And this is what I want to pray as we go to prayer. I want to pray that God makes us cot carriers tonight. Like, and I know Cody's married. I know Dan's not. So Dan can make that decision before he gets married to be a cot carrier. Cody and I, we have cot carriers in our house, but we need to be them for our wives. There are going to be moments where they may not want to do what's right, and we're like, you know what, honey, I love you enough. I'm going to help carry you in this moment. I'm going to help bear the weight because I know that it's going to be better if we could just be before Jesus right now. And even if you don't feel like you have the faith, I have faith. And I have enough faith that when Jesus looks, he can see mine. I'm going to carry you there. And then Jesus is going to start showing other people, you need to know this is what happens when the Son of, of, Son of Man is in the house. When Jesus is in the house, life's change. And I want you to see that. So he's working on a million levels here. He's working on the level of the blessing the four guys and their, their hard effort, blessing the guy that was paralyzed to see him not only get up, but to, be, to know that his sins are forgiven, to speak to the, to the scribes to recognize why they need to change, and the rest of the people to realize this is about forgiveness. You realize we, are the, we have the market cornered on forgiveness. No other religion preaches it. It's not about forgiveness. It's about working it off. And what I want to pray for us is that we become cock carriers and we recognize first how the Lord has removed, how he's lifted off Nassau, Afiemi. He's lifted off our sins and cast them as far as east is from west so we never have to face them again so that we could have the strength to get up and carry someone else's cot that needs it. Would you guys pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful text. Thank you so much for speaking to me tonight. Thank you so much, Lord, for reminding me you are recruiting cod carriers. This is what a disciple looks like in service. And we recognize that means there will be chances where we have, where it's going to smell bad and people are going to be just helpless. They're going to be helpless in their guilt, helpless in their sin. And we will want to be able to say, well, you just deserve it. Sit there in your smell, in your stink. But we recognize there are times that's us. And we don't want to be people who are just given over to thinking somehow it's just going to get better whether we play into it or not. We want to be real friends, real cot carriers, who love people enough that when real battles are being fought, they pick them up and carry them out and carry them to you, Jesus, where they belong. Jesus, I want to thank you for how you took all of our sins and you lifted them off of us, put them upon your shoulders, and died on the cross where we deserve to be. And you paid for all of our sins. And when you were buried, you buried them. And when you rose again, you left them there. And you give us that new life for which you just give us the choice. Do we want to say yes? And we say yes. We say, yes, Jesus, please be our Lord, be our Savior, and lead us forward. Lead us to be the ones who carry other cots, who would carry them to you because we know if we can get them to you, you could fix them. You could make them whole, even as you've made us whole at the cross. So, Lord, even tonight, I just pray you would move in our hearts, move in our hearts to be the people you call us to be, to be those cot carriers. And, Lord, if it ever be a case where we find ourselves in that situation, for whatever the reason, well then, Lord, may there be caught carriers around us that would do the same. And Lord, I recognize this is what you intended a family to be. So make us that, I pray. In Jesus' name.